You're listening to Two Girls, One Crossword. Well, I'll start by taking a sip from my Ooh, I feel ice, your ice cold water. Wow. Is that a new? It's a knockoff Hydro Flask. I was going to say, it looks like but a Hydro Flask. No, I'm now obsessed with drinking ice cold water, and I refuse to drink anything. Any yep. temperature below that, I swear to God, do not offer me room temperature, tepid, I only tap drink, water. I only drink warm water. No, you don't. Yes, it's true. No, you, you're such a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I love when I can still kind of um, trick you. You didn't at all. I, <laughs> I said right away, play it back. I said right away, that's not true. Well, the you only reason that. you said that's not true is because you were thinking like, maybe she does. She's just weird enough to maybe do that. No, you forget that we spent, we used to spend almost every day together, and I saw the water that you drank, okay? And it was ice cold from the fridge. Anyways. Okay, okay fine. Oh, my God. Nobody asked Welcome. you to know me. We are the Good Evening Girls. This we is are. Two Girls, One Crossword. Uh, I'm Chelsea. I'm Grace. Uh, this is your favorite weekly pod word crosscast. You're tuning Beautiful. in. One more week with us. One more week in quarantine, too. Don't forget it, folks. We're still locked One in our houses. One more week in paradise. <laughs> Don't forget that uh, there's still a pandemic going on out there. I feel like people just decided that they are bored. or like, They're like, I'm annoyed by having to do this, so I'm just going to stop now. I'm done. It's like, hello, you realize the longer that you keep acting like a fool, the longer we're going to have to do this for? Well, it, without getting too like depressed, but I feel like that's exactly what, you know, all the capitalists want us to do. They want us to like become desensitized to the crisis. I mean, we're like oh. losing. <laughs> Sorry, like, did you hear that scream I did. behind me? <laughs> Was someone, is someone like okay out there? I actually heard someone scream in my courtyard earlier, but I think it was like a husband scaring his wife. And I was like, that is rude. <laughs> That's rude. Well, you're just assuming it was like a harmless prank. That's true. I should have called the, the, the not the police. Sa- what? I'm, you cannot meow at me right now. I'm sorry for my cat <laughs> meowing in the background. Usually he doesn't do that. Um, and I'm sorry if you hear my dog barking or moaning because I am alone with my dog today. Um, and he is currently chewing on a bone, which you also might hear. So just bear with us. we got pets, okay? We're normal people with pets. <laughs> we should just do like a quick, we should have like a, a quick pet disclaimer that we always do in the beginning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, please don't mind any noises that our pets make. Thank you. And then just, <laughs> yeah. Because like, I feel like every on. time we're like, sorry, my cat's purring. My dog's barking. <laughs> um, that's just quarantine life. We don't have our little uh, voiceover booth to do this in. So we have to share with our needy animals. <laughs> wow, um, he is needy today. Yes. Should we get into it? Yes. Let's get into it. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> You have to tune in to YouTube to see exactly what just happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he has literally <laughs> never done that before. He is so not athletic either. He just like jumped what onto is he my back. Doing? You have <laughs> I don't know. He's obs- Arnold is an old soul. Okay. If you he met he's Arnold sick or something. He just, he just wants to cuddle and sit and like be pet. He has never done that. I didn't even know he had that in him. If if you're listening to this, check out our YouTube channel because you'll see my cat jump <laughs> from the bed onto my shoulders somehow. <laughs> Anyways, okay, let's just move on to our hits and shits. Let's shit. move I'll, on to it. I'll we have actually, to deal with that later. <laughs> we I actually hope. have one corrections corner. Yes. We what do. <laughs> you're like, what is it? I forget. Okay, so it was more for me. Um, mm-hmm. It was Well, actually, it's all for me. So Jesse Lansner <laughs> reached out to us on Twitter. Jesse does also come in handy a lot because we make mistakes, and Jesse lets us know. Uh, I talked last week about a New York Times Palo Pasco Aaron Aronson puzzle, where the opener and closer of the puzzle were two really complicated um, proper nouns in terms of like saying them and spelling them. <laughs> and one across... And that puzzle, which Coach K of the NCAA men's basketball fame spelled, and the answer spelled K-R-Y, or no, sorry, K-R-Z-Y-Z-E-W-S-K-I. And I said, Krzyzewski. Apparently, that is not how you pronounce that last name. You do not pronounce it phonetically in the English, you know, way. It is pronounced Krzyzewski. Oh, I feel like that name sounds more familiar to me, but I would never know how to, you could hold a gun to my head. I would not know how to spell that. Yeah, no, no, absolutely not. You would, you would get to kill me in that instance. Um, this guy, Shashevsky, was actually born and raised in Chicago, Grace. Grew up oh. in a Ukrainian village. There you go. 
Who would have thunk? Let's go Who visit his thunk? parents' house after this. Hello, Mama Shashevsky. You know? Actually, he's like 72 years old, so I don't know if his parents are around. <laughs> uh, doubtful, but could be. It could Never be. Know. Depends how old they were and they had him. Right, if they were like um, 18. Anyway, we can't hypothesize about this man's life. No. That, that's a different episode. <laughs> um, okay, well, I have a shit. It's Ooh, a general shit, though. A general shit. So I do the USA Today crossword on the USA Today crossword app, which I recommend to people because it's free. And you can only do the current day for free. You have to, like, use coins if you want to pay for previous days, whatever. It's this whole thing. But um, those crosswords are, like, really fun and easy. I mean, they're still challenging, but they're not as hard as New York Times. So if you're scared of the New York Times, do, you can do that one instead. But it has ads on it. And almost, like, when I finish a puzzle, almost every time the ad that comes up is for the NRA. <gasps> Like, consistently. Oh, no. I'm like, what is this? I, I don't think it's targeted. I never Google no. anything that has to do with guns, ever. No, they're paying for ad space, for sure. I wonder if we should tell Eric. Yeah. Well, it's also it feels like it's the wrong demographic. It's extremely. The, like, that's not what the USA Today is about. Yeah. Well, whatever. Let them waste their advertising money. But that <laughs> is my, my shit for, not really for the USA Today, but... It's just weird. I don't that know. That is strange. That's very strange. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I did an Evan Kalish USA Today uh, puzzle today. That was pretty good. Um, yeah. I actually didn't write down any hits or shits because no. I literally just <laughs> finished it seconds before we came on the call. So um, I don't. I didn't do the one today because it was really busy at work. But shout out to Evan. Was. He is our friend. Well, yes, Evan. Well, we think he's you're our like friend. Our, our digital friend. Yeah. <laughs> did your friend. Um, well, I, I found this interesting in the USA Today, um, the Outer Banks one on August 12th by Saoxin Bernakel, uh, largest fast food chain in China, KFC. I feel like I actually knew that, but now that I you're saying... I think I had heard that before, but that's just so interesting. I mean, it is, like, obviously KFC is... Actually, I've never had KFC, but I feel like fried chicken, people associate that with America. Right. KFC... So I could see how it's, like, very, you know popular like americana yeah oh yeah i i think the only time i ever had kfc i can count two times on my two fingers <laughs> i actually have 10 fingers but on two of them i'm counting these two times one was with my youth group we did like a fast food crawl where the pastor got us all in the van and drove us to each fast food place in town and we got to like spend money and i ate popcorn chicken at kfc and then the second time was in college and i was really drunk and my boyfriend took me there and i actually ate like you know like stuff from like a bucket of chicken which is like the typical kfc experience um i wouldn't recommend it i actually don't like kfc and i'm not like i don't like to crap on fast food i like fast food just not kfc (laughs) oh we like fast food we eat it we do we eat it fast Um, yeah uh i liked the incubator crossword charleston state on august 6th i think that was incubator by claire rimkus nice and she she just had some um really funny clues in here uh butcher types question mark was studs I could think of, like butcher like meat, but it's butch like the like oh, lesbian butcher. descriptor. So studs. Nice. Um she also referenced 30 Rock 10 down, the blank juror. Uh rural. <laughs> the rural juror, which is a show that a fake show from 30 Rock. Um, and then holding position question mark is Little Spoon. Very cute. And then Aww. also, adjective used to describe a more assertive woman, whereas a man would just be described as, you know, more assertive. And the answer is bossier. Oh, very true. We've all been there. Yeah. Um, I did the Saturday New York Times crossword, uh, August 8th, by Brooke Husik and Sid uh, Sivakumar. I believe they are both uh, constructors for the Lollapuzula Um Tournament. You know, tournament, which is actually going to happen, at bef- like, this will come out after the Lollapuzzle tournament happens. So this is like we're recording in the future, in the past. Ooh. Anyway, so I did their New York Times puzzle uh, on August eighth. If you hear my dog moaning loudly, <laughs> I apologize. He's so sad that I'm not paying attention to him. I want to call out uh, twenty one across. I really liked this clue and. Um, the answer demographic myth often used with respect to Asian Americans. Um, and the answer was model minority. Um, 
And I feel like if you are not familiar with that idea of like model minority, it is a myth, right? Um, and it kind of just dis- describes like a perceived minority group having perceived better like success, like socioeconomic success. Um, and it's like measured in your educational value, your professional value, like how much money you make, um, like the stability of like the home where you're like raising your family and your kids. Um, and it's basically in America used to contrast Asian Americans to black Americans, Latino and Hispanic Americans, suggesting that Asian Americans are, um, what is it? Like they're better citizens. They're law abiding. They model like citizens. Model, model citizens. They like, you know, they have like these, this beautiful stereotype in contrast to like black Americans, Latino or Hispanic Americans, which are like the criminals. So, um, I just think it's that's just inter- a way to pit, pit minorities against each other. It is, you know, white people are insane and they have to find ways to do that. So literally, uh, another good clue from this puzzle, which I really liked, it like stumped me for a long time. I just thought it was really creatively written 27 across. It's just above a four. And the answer is a dollar sign because on a keyboard, a dollar sign sits on the four key. Oh, I like that. That's yeah, cute. that's very good. Uh, and the last one from this puzzle, I just, this is not a shit. It's just a conversation mm-hmm. starter. I think we've talked okay. about this. Um, 42 across joint that sells joints. And the answer was pot dispensary. And the first thing I said was nobody fucking calls it pot. Who calls it pot, right? And so then I was like, you know what? Let me just like look this up because I feel like there's so many different things you can call weed, marijuana, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found a really interesting article about why we call pot pot or weed or marijuana or cannabis or any other number of, you know, terms. Uh, it's on the WBEZ Chicago website by Mariah Waffle. Uh, Waffle actually talked to a linguist at the University of Chicago and uh, a historian at the University of Cincinnati to to kind of describe like where we get these terms from and why we use them um, and why one generation might use one term and another generation another term. So pot is used usually by generation X, you know, like 1965 to like 1980. And then Mm -hmm. weed started getting popularized in the 21st century. And that's why millennials and like some Gen Z use that over pot. Um, Yeah. And so just, just, just interesting. So that is interesting. Yeah, I guess you're right. People don't really call it pot these days. Although I feel like I also wouldn't call it a weed dispensary. I would just say a dispensary. I agree. You wouldn't, I mean, if you're going to a dispensary, everybody knows where you're going. Yeah. You know, a Pez dispensary, (laughs) (laughs) which you can do in Connecticut. Actually, where I went to school is where the Pez factory is. So here's what I don't understand about Pez. Okay. (laughs) What don't you understand? It's like they're, they make it same as Tic Tacs. They kind of make it. So you feel like you're only supposed to have one, like one little tiny piece of candy and then call it a day for like an hour until it's like, what if no one eats Skittles like that? And it's the same dosage. So you don't have a thing with Tic Tacs though, don't you? Or was it you? I, well, yeah. I eat I eat them like the same way you would eat Skittles. And same yeah. with Pez. I don't even have time to put in the dispenser. I eat like the whole sleeve immediately. Well, but I don't think, I think, I have never just eaten one Pez at a time. I would like fill the dispenser and then eat the whole thing. The novelty yeah. was like eating Dispensing it out of this weird it. plastic, yeah, dispenser. I um, guess. Um, but Tic Tacs, okay, the mint Tic Tacs, I can kind of see you have one at a time. But like the orange Tic Tacs, you just have one of those? Are you a psychopath? Like it just makes no sense. Just it, they're tiny. It's like, well, that's my one M and M for the day. Like, <laughs> it's true. I don't like Tic Tacs at all, so I don't have to like worry about this. But I know how much you like Tic Tacs, and I I do I worry support about you. It. I don't buy them because it's a waste of money. It's, you barely get anything. No bang you get for nothing your buck. out of it. Yeah, yeah. If you want right, a mint, get an Altoid. <laughs> um. Yeah. Don't give me an Altoid. I'll eat the whole tin as well. <laughs> Uh, as you know, because I ate your entire Altoids tin. <laughs> She's, you can't get the, got to get this girl away from her mints, okay? Like, you put a mint in front of her, she goes crazy. I don't like to be told that, like, I can only have a little bit of something, you know? That'll just make me want the whole thing. Right. Um, but anyways, I'm done with my hits and shits. I've got one more puzzle I'm going to talk about. Uh, I did okay. the Wednesday, August 12th, New Yorker, uh, by Eric Agard. Um, just a couple things. 15 across, apex predator that starts and ends with the same letter. And the answer is anaconda. Um, Mm -hmm. first of all, I thought this was like a missed opportunity for a clue. No offense, Eric, uh, or whoever edited this puzzle. It could have been something like my blank don't want none unless you got spuns, hun. Well, it's funny that you say that actually, because last week I did read a, I did, um, 
see a puzzle that did that was like a Nicki Minaj song that samples Baby Got Back and Anaconda was the answer. Interesting. I didn't do that yeah. puzzle. I wonder why. And maybe maybe that was a USA Today and that's why he didn't do that clue. Maybe. I don't know. Who knows? N- not me. Uh, another one. I'm going to like out myself here. 39 Across. Favorite band members to K-pop fans. And the answer is biases. And yes, I have started listening to K-pop in quarantine and i know what biases is now so that's so any k-pop related questions uh direct them to chelsea because i know nothing other than jimin that's all i know (laughs) (laughs) i wouldn't say that i'm a k-pop stan because i think that's offensive to people who actually are yeah no you have to like really walk the walk before you can because that i mean it's intense over there it's really i've seen them on the internet and i just i respect they are a powerful powerful group they are scary i am still scared And I'm secretly listening to the music, like, every day on Spotify. And, like, that's all I need right now. I don't need to know the names or the album titles or the song names. We're just going to just enjoy the music for now. But I do know what biases are. So I just liked that that was... um, Biases is, like, a normal word, right? But the Mm -hmm. clue itself made it really fun. Um, Yeah. And if you don't know what that is, if you don't know what K-pop is, Google it. Google it. It's Korean pop. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Should we flip the coin, then? We should flip the coin. Okay. All right. I'm flipping the coin now. <gasps> it's tails. That's me. Okay. My topic today comes from the Washington Post, Monday, August 10th. Shout out to my sister. That's her birthday. By Ooh. Rob Gonzalez and Jennifer Lim. And it is 45 across Nostradamus, e.g. Is this like a saint? No. The answer is seer. Seer. Okay, I'm glad you didn't know what Nostradamus was, because I definitely have heard, I mean, I'm sure you've heard the name. You'll probably yeah. recognize when I explain it, but I kept getting him confused with Nosferatu. <laughs> <laughs> Very different, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's not a vampire, whatever Nosferatu okay. is supposed to be. Yeah, he's supposed to him. be um, definitely a vampire. It's like a remake of um, Dracula, Nosferatu. Well, actually, Nostradamus, okay. I didn't read anywhere that he's a vampire, but I don't have definitive proof that he is not a vampire. So okay, thank I'm you for clearing that, that up. There. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the answer was Seer. So you might know him. He's the one who, like, supposedly predicted all of these events way, way okay. back in the day. Okay. Um, so he's French. He's an astrologer and a physician, and he predicted the future, supposedly. But what's his real deal? What Let's is his freaking deal? I don't trust this guy. Should I trust him? Um. Mm, you have to make that decision for yourself. Okay. Okay. So he was born in December 1503, a Sagittarius. <gasps> Love uh, it. In the south of France. His name was Michel de Notre Dame. I'm sorry for my French pronunciation. I love Uh, it. His family was of Jewish heritage, but his grandfather converted to Catholicism to avoid persecution and changed his name from Gassonet to Nostradam. So we would never have, you know, his name would have been Gassonetus, I guess. I don't think it has the same (laughs) ring to it. It does not. Yeah. So he had eight siblings. His dad was a grain dealer and part-time notary. Um... I remember when I read that, it just reminded me of, like, the HGTV shows where it's like, I'm a grain dealer. My wife is a part-time notary. Our budget is $5 million, (laughs) (laughs) right? (laughs) Oh, okay. So he did really well in school growing up. He was super smart. Both his grandfathers were scholars, and they taught Nostradamus himself when he was young. One grandfather was a physician, and the other taught him classical languages. So he knew, like, three languages. Um, Must be nice. Yeah, he was a little genius. So when he was 14, he left his family to study in Avignon, France. His school was Catholic, and he often argued with the Catholic priests there. He always had, like, lots of questions. um, So he questioned. Okay. I can respect that. I also argued in my religion class in Catholic high school because I was an atheist, raised Lutheran, went to Catholic school. I was called a a witch on multiple occasions by my religion teacher. How about that? You have a lot in common with Nostradamus then. It was like the beginning of his contentious relationship with the church. Let's do Um, it. Yeah. So later he went to University of Montpellier, where he studied medicine and astrology. Apparently that was common at the time to study both. Okay. They don't do that anymore. And I don't think this was astrology like Virgo's are type A, you know. (laughs) (laughs) It's more like astronomy. But it, they it called it astrology in all the articles I read. Okay. Anyways. Okay. So after he graduated, he gave himself the name Nostradamus. Uh, his, his I like that like for him. Michel. Yeah. So that's the Latin version of his name. And that apparently was also a common thing to do at the time. So I looked up the Latin version of grace and it's gratia, 
And since okay. I also graduated from college, that is what I prefer to be called. <laughs> okay. So the first several years of... Um, Oh, wait, yeah. So he graduated college. He became a doctor. And the first several years of being a doctor, he spent traveling France dealing with the bubonic plague. Oh, Woof. We talked about the bubonic plague in my nursery rhyme episode. Yeah. Ring around the rosy. Okay. Pockets full of posy. Exactly. So Nostradamus was going around with his weird plague doctor mask. Um, Love it. But apparently he was a good plague doctor. So okay. he prescribed fresh air and water. I could have been a doctor. At that you could have okay. done it. Yeah. Yeah. He also recommended a low-fat diet and clean bedding, and he often administered an herbal remedy made from rose hips, which was later discovered to have a lot of vitamin C in it, which I use a rose hip oil on my face, so I'm glad to see that. Okay, Ooh. but entire towns were covered under his care, and his, while his herbal remedies were common to the era, his beliefs about infection control, like fresh air, clean sheets, not having corpses in the you know streets, not just hanging around people, yeah, yeah. Those were new and different. So um, that's, like, why he was so much more successful than everyone else. But since his beliefs were, like, so radical at the time, they could have um, resulted in charges of heresy and a sentence of death. So he was, like, always scared from the persecution of... He's got to watch his shit. Yeah, exactly. Um, Anyway, so he became, like, pretty famous because a lot of people knew that he had been able to heal a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people knew that he'd been able to heal a lot of people. Anyways, so he wrote a book (laughs) uh, listing the doctors and pharmacists he'd met in Southern Europe. He translated anatomical texts. He developed recipes for gourmet foods. And he received his doctorate in 1529 from the University of Montpellier. Uh, So, yeah. I don't know. Do you still have a lot in common with him? I mean. (laughs) He's making this bread. I am not. (laughs) But his life wasn't always butterflies and rosehip oil. Okay. Okay. Wow. He taught at the university for three years, but he left because the school was criticizing his so-called radical ideas. He ended up going to a town called Agen, Agen, France, where he married his wife and they had two children. But unfortunately, the plague came again. And so while he was trying to heal others, his wife and two young children all died from the plague. Oh, wow. Woof. That sucks. Yeah. So that kind of ruined his reputation because people are like, "Uh, you couldn't even save your own family. What's that about? And his in-laws even sued him for the return of his wife's dowry, which it's like... That's shitty. Different times back there. Yeah, right. (laughs) Um, But he moved on in life, as we have to. Uh, The next several years, he traveled through Southern Europe, and by 1544, heavy rains were again spreading the plague to Southern France. God damn. So... Yeah, he went back to being, um, he went back to France to help people with the plague and he managed to halt the spread of disease in one town. So he kind of like reinvigorated his reputation. Okay, amazing. In 1538, um, an offhanded remark about a religious statute resulted in charges of heresy against Nostradamus. Oh, he's so, got to watch his tongue. Okay. I know. He was ordered to appear before the church inquisition, but he decided to leave um, <laughs> France and travel throughout the years in Italy, Greece, and Turkey. And it's believed during this time is when he had his spiritual awakening. Oh, Okay. One of the legends of Nostradamus says that during his travels in Italy, he came upon a group of Franciscan monks identifying one as the future pope. The monk, called Felice Peretti, was ordained Pope Sixtus V in 1585, fulfilling the prediction. Oh my god, okay. He moved to a town called Salon, France, and he set up a medical practice. He remarried, and he started a new family and had six kids, so... Yeah, He was busy. Yeah. (laughs) And also, he appeared to be a devoted Catholic now, to an outsider. Okay. But he had a secret. Okay. Oh. Supposedly, at night he would spend hours in his study meditating in front of a brass bowl filled with water and herbs. Meditation would put him in a trance, and in such trances, visions would come to him. Oh my god. So Nostradamus began writing about his visions um, when he wrote the first of his almanacs. It contained predictions of things to come in the next year. The almanacs appeared each year from 1550 to 1565, and they were extremely popular, as you can imagine, because people haven't changed that much, right? Yeah, no. They're obsessed like us, with this stuff. Yeah. yeah. So the almanac spoke of astrological phases of the coming year and contained rhymed four-line verse, offering hints of upcoming events. So not only was he predicting the future, predicting the future, but he was also, like, making poems about it. It rhymed. <laughs> Which makes me think that, like, sometimes he probably, you know, like, bended something just to oh, get it to course. rhyme in a poem. He's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, this will work. Works. 
<laughs> yeah. He wanted to combine all of his work in one gigantic, easy-to-read manual uh, Makes called sense. Centuries. There would be 10 volumes, each with 100 predictions, and he forecasted humanity through the year 3797. So some people think that, that that's when he predicted the world was going to end, but that's just when his forecasts end. I mean, he had to stop eventually. Right. Okay, but also I want to say 10 volumes with 100 predictions each. It's like, okay, if you, obviously he's a very smart guy, you know, very educated. Mm -hmm. He knows about history. If you came up with 100 predictions times 10, so 1,000 predictions, a couple of them would come true. I mean, history repeats itself, right? Right. Um, So he became working on centuries in 1554. The first seven volumes were published the following year. He, like, cranked these babies out. Damn. And he completed the other volumes soon after, but would not allow them to be published until after he died. Interesting. Um, The Prophecies was published in 1555, and this has all of his um, long-term predictions. So that's, like, his most famous work today that people still... I think that is, like, a combination of the seven almanacs that he um, published. So... Nostradamus claimed to base his published predictions on judicial astrology, the art of forecasting future events by calculation of the planets and stellar bodies in relationship to the Earth, which sounds okay. familiar to what we do today with, like, uh, you know, our horoscope apps. Right. However, he did have criticism at the time. A lot of it was from the Catholic Church and other religious people who thought he was, you know, dabbling in things he shouldn't be dabbling in. But he was also criticized by professional astrologers of the day for incompetence and assuming that horoscopy could predict the future. Okay. Everyone needs to take a chill pill. Yeah. But this, of course, did not stop him from becoming super famous, even among royalty. He was invited to the Paris court of Henry II and his wife, Catherine de' Medici. And the Medicis yeah. were known for their Europe-wide political ambitions. The queen hoped that Nostradamus could give her guidance um, in, you know, her role as the queen, but also regarding her seven children. Um, so he did, like, give... He said that five or four of her sons would become kings, and they all did, but they also all died really young. Ooh. So um, one of his predictions that he told the king read the young lion will overcome the older one on the field of combat in single battle he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage two wounds made one then he dies a cruel death so nostradamus told king henry he said that you should not go to any ceremonial jousting tournaments or whatever things in your 41st year of life Mm -hmm. so did henry listen to him no no he can't it's like henry one year Give up the jousting. Yeah. (laughs) That's it. Um, But before we get there, I want you to know that Nostradamus spent a lot of time, like, in the royal court. He was, like, kind of living this life of luxury because he was, you know, the king, queen's uh, little BFF friend. Yeah. Um, But the pesky Catholic authorities were again becoming suspicious of his prophecies and they were going to investigate him. So he returned to his hometown with his wife and children. Okay. But anyways... Then Henry II turned 41 years old in 1559. He was injured in a jousting tournament celebrating two marriages in his family. Um, In front of a big group of people, his opponent's lance, quote, pierced the king's golden visor, entered his head behind the eye, both blinding him and penetrating deep into his brain. And he died. Oh. And if you remember, the prediction said, on the field of combat in single battle, he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Two wounds made one. Holy heck in a hen basket. Yeah. So he should have listened to Nostradamus, but he didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. So, yeah. Well, we'll talk about that particular one later. But okay. Nostradamus ended up dying in Salon, France in 1566. The night before he died, he did tell his, like, receptionist that he wouldn't make it until the next day. He was, like, very sick at that point, though. Okay. Um, centuries was translated into multiple languages after his death, and they remain popular to present day. Many people believe that his predictions were right, and others point out that the verses are vague and can be read in many different ways. What do you think? Now I'm going to talk about some of his predictions that he made. Let's do it. But first I want to circle back to the Henry II prophecy. Okay. According to Nostradamus, the illustrated prophecies, um, that author says that the prophecy is in doubt because it didn't appear in print until 1614. After it already happened. Okay. So the legend is that, like, Nostradamus told him not to do that, supposedly, right. but it was oral. So there's no concrete proof that okay. he officially told him that. But, sure. you know, that's just kind of how it's been spun throughout history. That's, okay. like, one of the most popular predictions that you'll see if you look them up. Okay. Um, okay. And then the rest of these are from businessinsider.com. 
Let's do it. Which I don't know why they're doing it. Like, why are they posting it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one of his predictions supposedly was the Great Fire of London. And this Mm. is his, the poem. The blood of the just will commit a fault at London. Burnt through lightning of 23 the 6, the ancient lady will fall from her high place. Several of the same sect will be killed. So, burnt through the lightning of 23's the 6. 23's the 6. 20 times 3 is 60. Add 6 and you get 66, which was the year of the London fire. However, the fire was not set off by lightning. Um, it was set off by like a fire in a bakery. Um, several of the same sect will be killed. Yes, a lot of peasants did get you know were killed in the fire but also it's like this is extremely vague i mean yeah no that's very vague he does talk about london but i don't know 23 is the six he got the year right but he couldn't have just written the year yeah he had to make us do complicated mental math true okay the next is the french revolution Ooh. um the prediction was from the enslaved populace, songs, chants, and demands, while princes and lords are held captive in prisons, these will, in the future, by headless idiots, be received as divine prayers. Again, that's pretty vague. I mean, I feel like you can... That's just a, a prediction of a revolution. Obviously, a revolution right. would eventually happen. So, right. there's that. A lot of people think that he predicted Hitler. Hitler's oh. rise to power. So these are the two predictions that people, or this is one of the predictions that people um, associate with Hitler. From the depths of the west of Europe, a young child will be born of poor people. He who by his tongue will seduce a great troop, his fame will increase towards the realm of the east. He was born in Western Europe. He was born in Austria. Mm-hmm. But his family was not poor. They were middle class. So Right. So he was a little but, wrong there. Uh, yeah, his tongue did seduce a great troop, because he was a great orator, as they say. Yes, as they do say that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Another one that people think he predicted was the bombing in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Ooh. Near the gates and within two cities, there will be scourges, scourges, the like of which was never seen. Famine within plague, people put out by steel, crying to the great immortal god for relief. That one does apply. But again, it's also extremely vague. It is extremely vague. Give me a city name. Yeah. Give me a year. Um, I'm, I'm here for him. I'm here for him. He's trying really hard, but, you know, again, he could have are, meditated wrote, a little longer, maybe. Yeah. He wrote and, at least like a thousand of these, and these are the ones that fit with history. So I want to read the ones right. that like, haven't come true yet. Okay. <laughs> right. um, the assassination of John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy. Ooh. The great man will be struck down in the day by a thunderbolt. An evil deed foretold by the bearer of a petition. According to the prediction, another falls at nighttime. Conflict at Reims, London, and a pestilence in Tuscany. So JFK received many petitions, a.k.a. death threats, while he was president. Mm -hmm. He was killed during the day, and then his brother uh, Bobby Kennedy was, sorry, JFK was assassinated during the day, and his brother Bobby Kennedy was assassinated a few years later, just after midnight. So one down in the day, another falls at nighttime. However, mm. the last line, conflict at Reims, London, and a pestilence in Tuscany uh, doesn't really tie in with no, the Kennedy. It's a little, so, <laughs> it's a, little, a little vague here. Yeah. Um, okay. 9-11. Oh, I was wondering if he did this one, yes. too. Earth-shaking fire from the center of the earth will cause tremors around the new city. Two great rocks will war for a long time. Then, Arethusa will redden a new river. Okay, so yeah, we have new city. Not New York City, it just says new city. A new city, right. Two okay. great rocks. Okay. If you uh, consider buildings yeah. rocks. But n- I don't know about the reddened river and fire from the center of the earth. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Sounds like a stretch to me. Okay, so I'm going to end on if he predicted COVID or not. Because <sighs> I have... Okay, First of all, I just want to say, he predicted a lot of plagues. But you have to remember, most of his life was dealing with plagues. So, <laughs> it was on his mind, all right? Yeah, he was thinking about it a lot, okay? Yeah. But there is a, like, quote that I, I have seen on social media, and it came up when I was uh, researching, too, that people attribute to Nostradamus. And it goes like this. There will be a twin year from which will arise a queen who will come from the east and who will spread a plague in the darkness of night 
on a country with seven hills, Italy, and will transform the twilight of men into dust to destroy and ruin the world. It will be the end of the world economy as you know it. Okay, first of all. Well, that's great. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I am here to clear clear the air. He did not write that. That is a made up. People have searched. There is no, people have like searched his work. There's no mention of Twin Years, um, Country with Seven Hills. Also, it's like, if you even know Nostradamus, he writes in four line poems. So, So, like, he wouldn't write a whole paragraph. Like, if you're going to make a fake (laughs) rumor about my man Nostradamus, at least make it sound real. Come on. Try like a little bit harder. But anyways, you know a bunch of people are like spreading that around me. Of course. Oh my god, it's real. The world uh, economy is yeah. completely destroyed. We're done. Uh, so yeah, that's Nostradamus. Uh, okay. As far as I could tell, he did not predict COVID. And if you think he predicted any of those other, you know, that's up to your own discretion. Personally, I agree with his critics who say he was very vague. He made a lot of predictions. And as we know, history tends to repeat itself. So I think if I, I could write down like 2,000 predictions of what would happen in the next you know, hundreds of years. And I, a couple of them would probably, would probably be right. So I think so. And I also think like maybe if he had, instead of decided to write thousands of predictions, if he had focused on like five, maybe we would have a little bit more clarity. Yeah. True. He spread himself too thin. Okay. He was at the, he was traveling between his hometown and the courts. He was, you know, dealing with the plays. With the the king and the queen. And then he left his whole family and his six kids with his wife. What about that? No one talks about that. He was also a doctor and an astrologist. It's like, dude, pick a lane. Just Just relax. Just breathe, okay? Just breathe. Anyway, (laughs) shout out to Nostradamus. Thanks for trying, buddy. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, let's get to it. Um, My topic comes from the Saturday, August 8th, New York Times crossword by Brooke Husick and Sid Sivakumar. One down. Taj Mahal, for example. And the answer is tomb. Ooh, so, I didn't know it was a tomb. I'm, I'm so right? dumb. Right? <laughs> okay, so I'm fucking dumb, too, because I also didn't know it was a tomb. <laughs> um, I only had the T to go off of, and I was like, four letters. I'm like, is it a fucking tomb? Am I that idiotic that I, I didn't thought it know? Was a ca- I thought it was like a castle. Like a palace or something? Yeah. No, it is not. It is a tomb, okay? So, yes, yes, <laughs> our dear listeners were talking about the Taj Mahal, which is a tomb in case you are also stupid. It's a tomb. Um, the Taj Mahal actually comes up a lot in crosswords, I think. Um, it's it usually does. Taj. Taj okay. or Agra comes up a lot, which is like, the Taj Mahal is located here, and it's mm-hmm. Agra. Agra being the city where it's built. Um, and Agra is actually like crosswordies because it's like four letters. It's got some great like letter combinations, whatever. Um, so, yeah, I felt like it was finally time for one of us to take a deep dive. And I thought this would actually be a topic Grace would do. But she doesn't do Saturday puzzles, so I knew that I was in the clear. You got me there. Uh, I got her there. I actually have my notes right here. It wasn't until this puzzle that I learned the Taj Mahal was, in fact, a tomb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I feel better that we're on the same level, at least. Yeah, it goes to show, though, like, how, like, subpar, I think, parts of our education were and, like, whitewashed in a way. Like, we just learned oh, a bit yeah. of it as, like, oh, I want seven wonders of the world, this, like, beautiful palace. It's not even a freaking palace. It's a tomb you know and it's not even always a seventh wonder of the world if you listen to (laughs) listen to it it's episode number two okay um but yeah it's a tomb it's a massive beautiful mausoleum uh it was commissioned by the mogul emperor shah jahan in 1632 um and it was to house the remains of his wife uh her name her birth name is arjumand banu begum but she is better known as mumtaz mahal so Shah Jahan was born as Prince Shihab Ub Din Muhammad Karam in Lahore, Pakistan in 1592. He was the son of the then emperor at the time, Emperor Jahan Gir. Uh, and at this time in India and Pakistan, inheritance, like in terms of like inheriting the throne and power was not done by primogeniture, which is like firstborn, you know, inherits the throne. Mm-hmm. It was instead princely sons would have to kind of compete militarily um, in terms of military success um, and then would also have to like consolidate their power at court and through doing those things and waging wars on their own brothers and their own family members they would then inherit the throne or they would like overthrow the current shah and take the throne which is kind of interesting yeah without getting 
too far into the complex history of the Mughal emperor empire, um, I will give you a little bit of historical background on Shah Jahan, who I may also occasionally refer to as Prince Karam, okay? Because most of his life, he was a prince, and for a small portion of his life, he was the Shah. Okay, so Shah Jahan, also known as Prince Karam, did not get along well with his father's new wife, who is mm. called Nur Jahan, okay? It's like Nur- a parent trap. Exactly. <laughs> Nur Jahan had aims to put her own sons or her son-in-laws on the throne. And so, of course, Shah Jahan was like, this is not working for me. Like, my dad's, like, second wife is going to, like, try and take what I believe to be my right. Mm-hmm. He was not happy. So Shah Jahan tried leading a rebellion against his own father and failed. Oh, Idiot. Embarrassing. Yeah, it was kind of embarrassing. He was actually exiled for a bit because of it. Um, yeah. I can understand that. Um, but then his father died, and his father's wife, Nur Jahan, tried to, like, take the throne and get her sons and son-in-laws to have more power at court. But her brother actually was like, you know what? Not cool. Took the side of Shah Jahan, Prince Karam, um, and actually overthrew Nur Jahan and placed Shah Jahan on the throne. Um, his and that, own sister for his yes. step-nephew? There's right. no family loyalty here. Well, here's the, here's the catch. The sis, Nur Jahan's brother had a daughter who Shah Jahan eventually married. Okay? So there's like, okay, okay. it's all interconnected here, okay? Mm-hmm. Anyway, so Shah Jahan was made emperor. He became the fifth emperor of the Mughal Empire. Uh, He reigned from 1628 to 1658. That's 30 years. Uh, And during his time as emperor, he was known for being like a fierce military competitor, but he's most well known for his architectural achievements. Under his reign, the empire entered into a golden age of Mughal um, architecture. He commissioned tons of buildings and monuments the most famous being the Taj Mahal. And because of his, like, you know, interest in architecture, he was given the title the Builder of the Marvels. Kind of cool. Some other commissions that he did were the Red Fort in Delhi, the Agra Fort in Agra, the Jama Masjid Mosque in Delhi, and the Wazir Khan Mosque in Lahore. These are all insanely beautiful buildings that I had never seen before. Just, you know, Google them, I guess. Yeah. They're very pretty. I I believe it. I mean, it was the same guy who did the Taj Mahal. Right. Exactly. All of this being said, much of Shah Jahan's legacy um, is kind of overshadowed by something that began before he even sat on the throne and before he even tried rebelling against his father. Let's, like, go back to 1607, okay? Shah Jahan, currently known as Prince Karam, is 15 years old. So this is 15 years before he rebelled against his father and 21 years before he took the throne. He was betrothed to a 14-year-old girl named Arjumand Banu Begum, okay? They got married in 1612, and it's said that she became the unquestioned love of Prince Karam's life. Aww. Right? It's kind of cute. He was, like, obsessed with her. He thought that she was the most beautiful um, woman, like, of the time. She had the best personality of any woman he had ever met. Yeah, Um, that's how you feel about anyone you like when you're 15. No offense. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, And so because he was like so in love with her, he gave he changed her name. He gave her a new title um, and her new title is Mumtaz Mahal, meaning jewel of the palace. Um, Yeah. Mumtaz Mahal was actually not his first wife. It was his second wife. Um, Wait, I thought he was 15 when they got married. He was 15 when they were betrothed in 1607 and in 1612 is when they got married. So he was like, what, 19? Yeah, no. Seven, that's five years later. He's 20. 20, okay. And so, like I said, Mumtaz Mahal was his second wife. Um, He actually got married to a princess before her and had his first child with that Mm -hmm. princess, um, who was a daughter. But outside of his first wife, the princess, and outside of Mumtaz Mahal, he had three other wives, um, so five wives total. But according to the official court chronicler, whose name is Kwaswini, Shah Jahan's relationship with his other wives was purely political um, Mm -hmm. and had nothing to do with love. Um, It was all about the status of, you know, marriage at court. He wanted to show that he had a lot of wives because he wanted to, you know, consolidate his power at court. Mm -hmm. Here's a quote from the court chronicler. 
about Mum Taj Mahal. Quote, the intimacy, deep affection, attention, and favor which his majesty, his majesty had for the cradle of excellence Mumtaz exceeded by a thousand times what he felt for any other. So he really liked her. She was the best wife. She was the best. That probably felt pretty good. Right? Yeah. Well, she I got... hate to be one of the other wives, although they probably, they probably lived pretty comfortably. They probably lived comfortably, right? Um... So it said that there was genuine love between them. And I'm kind of I'm kind of getting that vibe from all the sources that I read from. They kind of really liked each other. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to diminish Mumtaz Mahal's role within her relationship and then also, like, as an empress. First and foremost, she bore Shah Jahan 14 children. Oh, my God. 14 yeah, I guess they started early, but... Children. That's crazy to me. <laughs> any, when I hear someone like... has two kids, I'm like, you're nuts. Is there, like, quadruplets in there? <laughs> no. <laughs> that's, a lot of, that's a lot of time to get pregnant. It is a lot of time to be pregnant. Um, and, okay, so she had 14 kids, and he loved her, blah, blah, blah. Apparently, he showed his love through grand gestures. Uh, Mum Taj Mahal's royal residence was a part of the Agra Fort. Um, it was decorated in pure gold, precious stones, and had rose water fountains. Um, and of the royal allowances that he gave to his wives, Mum Taj Mahal's was the largest. She had 1 million rupees per year to spend. Oh, my gosh. I know. Uh, God, all these royal families, like, throughout everywhere are so unnecessarily bougie. Well, uh, yeah. like, the people who live in their countries are... Right. Dying. Like, yeah, peasants at that, you know, yeah. era. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, outside of, like, him loving her and her bearing his children uh, and, like, him, like, you know, basically being her sugar daddy... Uh, she was actually a very politically astute woman. It was said that she had, like, a better political mind than her husband. She was better at chess than, like, a lot of men at court, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, if you're, like, a genius at chess, like, you're, you know, very strategically minded. Um, so, yeah, she was a politically astute woman. Uh, she served as a crucial advisor and confidant to her husband before he became the emperor. Um, and then after he became emperor, Shah Jahan changed her titles to Malika Ajahan, which means queen of the world, and Malika Uz Zamani, which means queen of the age. Like, this man loved this woman. Mm-hmm. I would love anyone to call me queen of the world every single day or queen of the age. Are you kidding? Yes. Um, and as an empress, she had a lot of great power, and her husband often consulted her in matters of state. He even bestowed upon her his imperial seal, which validated <laughs> imperial <Hello>. decrees. <laughs> Right? Like, that's what every woman wants. Um, it was actually, like, a huge honor to be given the imperial seal because it basically, that's what he uses to say, yes, I say yes to this thing. And that's how they would validate that these different orders and imperial decrees were, you know, true. And mm-hmm. so he gave that to her. So she had control over the seal, which is, like, a huge deal. Damn. Yeah. Sadly, however, she died in 1631. Uh, she died after giving birth to their 14th child. Kind of, you know, her. <laughs> par for the course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she was 38. Uh, I know. Okay. I'll see. Yeah. I know. Um, it's so young. It's so young. She had a postpartum hemorrhage. <sighs> it is said that Shah Jahan's grief was so great that he entered into a year of secluded mourning. Um, and when he appeared again, it was said that all of his hair had turned white, his back was bent, and his face was worn. Sad boy. Sad if my husband boy. doesn't do that when I die young. <laughs> swear to God. <laughs> What's the point? Yeah, what is the point? Why are we even trying? That's actually in the prenup when you get married. Yeah. <laughs> your hair better turn white, I hey, swear. If you don't break your goddamn back after I die, I swear. <laughs> I will haunt you, okay? <laughs> Truly. That's the one thing clear. <laughs> okay, so he's the sad boy, right? He, got, he yeah. went into mourning, he came out, and he decided... This is how I'm going to commemorate the love of my life, the queen of the world, the queen of this age is, you know, life. He decided to build her a large mausoleum. So the mausoleum was built across the, Yum- the Yamuna, Yamuna River from his own royal palace in Agra. Um, and it would be Mumtaz Mahal's final resting place. And it is now known as the Taj Mahal, named after Mumtaz Mahal. So construction began in 1632, a year after her death, and would continue for the next two decades. It took more than 20,000 workers and 1,000 elephants to complete the complex. Because it's, oh it's not just the, the, pal- the building itself mm-hmm. where the actual tomb is. It's like the whole, like, 
garden acres and ec- yeah. acres of gardens and like you know there's mosques and all different types of buildings on the complex okay so what does it look like first of all it's constructed in all white marble it's inlaid with semi-precious stones so jade crystal lapis lazuli amethyst and turquoise so if you were to look at pictures of the walls of the taj mahal like they have these beautiful like they almost look like um what's the word um mosaic mosaics basically it's mm-hmm. called pietra dora is like the the architectural term the term thank you yeah. very much <laughs> um and it's just like these really beautiful patterns of these like beautiful pieces of glass and then in the glass are these inlaid gems like i just can't imagine how much money this cost them mm-hmm. to make um the mausoleum has one central dome. It is 240 feet tall, uh, and this dome is surrounded by four smaller domes and then four slender towers at each corner. There are verses of the Quran inscribed on like the entryways, so the entrances are all arched. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's also more Quran inscriptions across the whole complex, which is in accordance to Islamic tradition. Um, inside the mausoleum, there's an octagonal marble chamber and in this chamber there is a cenotaph which is a fake tomb for mumtaz mahal Um, her actual tomb is buried at garden level so below um so it's actually she's buried there but she's not in like the main tomb room which you can see if you go and like become a tourist and like go look at it Mm -hmm. um the main gateway is made of red sandstone, um, and then there's a square garden just beyond that, divided into quarters by long pools of water. Um, and like, if you've seen anybody who's been to India take a photo in front of Taj Mahal, they probably took it in that like little entryway just past the sandstone. Yeah. You know, gate I feel with like the pools. all the pictures are from the same spot. Exactly. I mean, it's beautiful. So I it's, can see why people want their picture there, but it's insanely beautiful. Um, outside of like the many other reasons people are visiting the Taj Mahal, like history and just like looking at the architecture, one of the main reasons is because the Taj Mahal actually changes hue depending on what time of day it is. So like I said, it's built in white marble. Um, and then depending on where the sun is positioned in the sky, uh, it changes colors from like pearly gray to pink in the morning, dazzling white at high noon, uh, orange bronze at sunset and a translucent blue in the evening. Um, and you can... It's very pretty. Uh, you can even buy tickets to see the mausoleum and all of its colors on the full moon or during an eclipse, which that would be so cool to like plan your, you know, trip to India, like on like a full moon or like eclipse or whatever. Yeah, but you know, those eclipse tickets are probably expensive. Yes, actually, um, foreigners have to spend, have to pay more money than um, Indian nationals that like are from India. That's they, how like, it should be. It's how it should be. It's like 50 rupees for like if you're Indian and then like a thousand. If you're, I think that's, that's pretty common. I've seen that other places. Yeah, I've seen that too. So where was I? We've talked about the color, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yes. Okay. Here's another little fun tidbit. Shah Jahan originally planned to have his own mausoleum built across the river so that he could be entombed in his own mausoleum. Um, and then their mausoleums would be connected by a bridge. And his mm-hmm. mausoleum, he wanted to be hewn from black marble so that they could be like exact opposites of one another, yes. which is very cute. Sadly, this never happened um, because his third son actually deposed him uh, in, 15, in 1658 and took power for himself. Uh, and Shah Jahan lived the rest of his life under house arrest uh, and died in 1666. And then he, his son actually buried him in the mausoleum with Mum Taj Mahal. So they're oh. buried together, but he nice. never got his black, you know, Taj Mahal, which would be freaking cool. Could you imagine? That if would there's be like, really cool. Yeah. Think of the Instagram picture. <laughs> God, I hate that, but seriously, it'd be yeah. beautiful. Another, like, fun little tidbit. There's a myth. You might hear this myth, and it's fake, okay? But I'm going to tell it to you anyway, because I think it's amazing. Well, it's not amazing. It's kind of sad, but it's intriguing. So there's a myth that Shah Jahan wanted to ensure that no one could recreate the Taj Mahal's beauty, so he supposedly severed the hands and gouged the eyes of the artisans and craftsmen who worked on the mausoleum. Oh my gosh, those poor guys are like, dude, I've been working for two decades on this thing. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Um, and so um, this cannot be proven, but it's still something people talk about or mm-hmm. say. So, okay, as of 2014, UNESCO documents that there are seven to eight million people every year that visit the Taj Mahal. Uh, and at peak tourist season, you can like expect to see 45,000 people pass through the gates of the Taj Mahal in a given day. Wow. That is crazy to me. 
Um, like I said, it's considered one of the seven wonders of the world, which you can hear Grace talk about on episode two, one of our earliest episodes. Um, and then what else here? Oh, yes. Air pollution in India is a big issue. Um, but it's also a huge issue around Taj Mahal because it kind of threatens the white facade of the mausoleum. Mm-hmm. So in 1998, India's Supreme Court ordered a number of anti-pollution measures to kind of protect the mausoleum from further deterioration. So like a bunch of local factories were closed down um, and vehicular traffic was banned from the immediate proximity of the mausoleum. So if you're a tourist, you ha- kind of have to like park your car kind of far away and then walk to the mausoleum or you get into like an electric bus and they drive you closer. Oh, wow. Right? Um, it, that's like white is, is, you know. It's dangerous. Very high maintenance. Yeah. It is. It is high maintenance. And speaking of high maintenance, the mausoleum occasionally gets a little spa day. I it love it for it. her. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Uh, it's, um, they do like a, a spa day whenever it kind of turns like a brownish yellow color, which is, you know, semi-frequently mm-hmm. for, I mean, I mean, not often buildings, you know, get a facial, right? Yeah. Um, they use this mud pack facial called Mul- <laughs> Multiani Miti, and they rub it all over the marble, and then they wash it off with brushes to remove any blemishes and bring back that, like, nice white color. She got a sheet mask? Yes, it's <laughs> really great. Sheet mask. <laughs> I would actually love to be there on the day where they do the facial. Yeah, they have, like, two huge cucumbers <laughs> <laughs> on the doors. <laughs> That's disrespectful. (laughs) Too soon. (laughs) Too soon. Too soon. I'm sorry, Mom Taj Mahal. She didn't mean it. Um, That's kind of like all I have for the Taj Mahal, but I wanted to talk about a couple other like famous tombs that you Mm -hmm. may have heard of. Um, I think it's interesting that like, this is like my personal experience. Um, I like going to graveyards, like walk around and like look at the tombs and the graves and like, I don't think there's anything morbid about it. And then I think a lot of people do find that a little bit too eerie or too scary or whatever. How often are you going to graveyards? I've never heard you say that you're going to a graveyard. You mean like when you're traveling and stuff? When I'm traveling, I go to graveyards. But I also have been to almost every single graveyard in the city of Chicago because I filmed my thesis film in a graveyard. And so I've seen... You've never invited me. That's what I'm saying. I'm sorry. Okay. I can take you to them. They're really... They're great. Um, But yeah, like I love like when I'm traveling to go to graveyards and there's some people that don't like to do that at all. But then I'm like, but you want to go to Taj Mahal. I'm sure you want to go to Taj Mahal. Or like Okay, but we've already established most people don't even know that that's a tomb. (laughs) Right. Okay. So I just think it's interesting that there's some really amazing touristy, quote unquote, attractions that Mm -hmm. draw people. But they won't like walk in around their local cemetery, you know? Wake up, sheeple. Try new things. What are you trying to push? You want people to visit their local cemeteries (laughs) more? I feel like, you know, that's for people visiting their their loved ones. It doesn't need to become like a social (laughs) vine. It's just respecting the dead, okay? Like, I think we need to have a better relationship with death, right? Okay. You're like, (laughs) shut up! (laughs) All right, so I'm going to talk about some other famous tombs. The first is the Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, It's actually the final resting place of Pharaoh Khufu uh, from around 2560 BC. Uh, The pyramid was actually originally covered in polished white limestone, so it would, like, reflect the sun and just be, like, really shiny, like this beautiful beacon out in the Mm -hmm. middle of the desert and really spectacular, which is kind of cool. I would love to go see the pyramids. Um, Have you seen the pictures of the pyramids and then, like, they turn the camera and show what's really behind it? Yeah, it's kind of, it's it's really interesting to think about, like... That's how a lot of places are, though. Yeah. Like, a lot of these touristy areas it's like they've become so over like venice oh yeah you know oh yeah it's sad it's sad but it's also kind of interesting like there's people that need to make money off of this so i guess no i i don't blame the people for making money no no, but it's just interesting how something can look in a picture versus what it's really like when you're there yes i agree with you just like how i look in any of my pictures versus how i look in real life so exactly okay uh, what else we got here? Oh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is uh, located in the old city of Jerusalem. It's a church built over the burial pa- place of Jesus Christ himself. Okay, so you can go there and visit it, I think. I mean, maybe you want to one day. I don't. Uh, what else we got? Oh, the Mausoleum of the First Kin or Quinn Emperor. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, this is actually where the Terracotta Army was discovered. Um, they kind of accidentally excavated this you know emperor's 
tomb and then they found the ter- terracotta army which are thousands of life-size terracotta like soldiers chariots horses you know weaponry mm-hmm. uh there's still more of this tomb to be excavated and it's rumored that in the actual tomb room or like where the actual central tomb is located it's circled by rivers of mercury so maybe one day we'll find out it's kind Mm -hmm. of interesting Um, and this one's my favorite well favorite it's like the most eerie Uh, catacombs of paris also called the empire of the dead it's miles of underground catacombs beneath paris uh, and it holds the skulls and bones of at least six million parisians actually i think i i went to that but you only see like a part of it right obviously it would take forever yeah um it basically in the 18th and 19th century like paris was overrun with disease and so they exhumed all these bodies from the the graveyards which they thought was what was causing all these infections and deaths and they took them all underground um and basically the bones are just stacked up on top of each other it's just kind of like really eerie to think about that these people Mm -hmm. were buried in graveyards exhumed and then moved underground and you can go look at them to this day um and there's like a million more really cool tombs that you can look up online but i just wanted to talk about those couples I'm surprised I've never heard of the tomb over Jesus's resting place. Because you think that would be like a, I don't know. I don't even know what it looks like. Like I've never I seen no a idea. picture of it. But considering yeah. how like Christian centric so much of our education is, right? I've like never even heard of that. I wonder. I'm sure there's some like discrepancy over where whether it's like among different Christian groups if that's like the true, the true place. That's all I have for tombs and for the Taj. I got a lot of my info from the Smithsonian and UNESCO, history.com, and tajmahal.org. Thanks for that. All, all great. All fun. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All righty. Well, I guess that's it, everyone. That's, that's it. That's all. That's all we got today. Um, Talked about some if, two good things. <laughs> if you want to talk to us on Twitter, we're at the Good Eve Girls. Or Instagram at the Good Evening Girls. Or TikTok at the Good Eve Girls. Come have fun with us. We love to hear from you. We do. I'm Gratia. Oh my God, and I'm just Chelsea. No, no language uh, has a fun name for me. So I don't I'm think, just yeah, Chelsea. I don't, I don't think Chelsea has a Latin version. But. When I was taking Spanish classes in like school, um, everybody got like a Spanish name. Oh yeah, um, what's the Spanish name for Chelsea? They just called me Catherine. Okay. Like the the Spanish version of Catherine. Yeah. Which so. is just Catherine. Catherine? Yes, exactly. It's like this. You say Catherine with a Spanish accent. <laughs> Chelsea, Kelsey, Mom, if you're listening, do you have a version of Chelsea? She's not listening anymore. She's too busy with the baby. Oh my um, god. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, anyways, uh, we will see you guys next week. Thanks for joining us, and uh, that's it. And that's all, folks. Ha- happy quarantining. Happy quarantine. Bye. Bye. Bye.